Hello and welcome to Money, Me and COVID-19, where we meet with leaders from the world of business, finance, investing and politics to try and understand what's really going on in this pandemic and how we can position ourselves to survive and then thrive in the aftermath. My guest today is a, a former RAF engineer who went on to have a successful business career before entering Parliament in 2010. Now, he's a particularly rare creature. He's a Conservative MP who actually espouses Conservative values like liberty, sound money, and free enterprise. Now, he's well known as a Brexiteer and was actually part of the Brexit ministry team until he resigned over a, a, a policy difference with Theresa May. What's less well known is that he's also a strong advocate for reform in the financial system, and he's used his roles in the Treasury Committee and the 1922 committee as, as platforms for those views. He is the MP for Wickham, the Right Honourable Steve Baker. Steve, welcome to Money and Me. Graham, thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, if we can, there's so many things I want to talk to you about, but let's start almost at a, a philosophical level. Uh, I think certainly in the 10 years you've been in Parliament, and maybe even longer than that, um, I, I sense that people's expectations of our governments and our political leaders have, have escalated enormously to the point where almost everything seems to be you know, their problem that they have to do something about rather than my problem that I have to do something about. Have you sensed that change and, 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 and what, how do you feel that's come about? But the, in, in particular in the short run, coronavirus has dramatically rolled forward the state and my experience of the public is they've really appreciated the decisions the government's taken to prop up, uh, prop up the economy to try and build that bridge to get us forwards. But <laughs> the point you raise is a very, very important one. And uh, the challenge, I suppose, is to give you a brief answer. If the state's going to shut down large swathes of the economy, then it does have a duty to try and bridge us through the gap. The big question is whether that's going to work, the extent to which it will, and how fast the recovery is. But I suppose the, just zooming out, the big picture here is why, why are we in the mess we're in with the public finances and the general politics of it? Well, it cannot be because for 100 years, government's been too small, taxes have been too low, surpluses have been run too often, money's been sound. That cannot be the reason, because if you go through economic history, we've had 100 years of growing the size of the state, spending at the limits of taxation and beyond, deficits with just a few exceptions of surplus, and a chronic expansionary environment in, in, in the monetary system. So, you know, if whatever crisis we're in, it's a crisis of big government. It's not a crisis of freedom. So I, I suppose that would be my best short answer to a very big question. Oh, indeed. And I mean, I'm now halfway through my seventh decade and, and, and I'm seeing things that, frankly, I never expected to in my lifetime, including shutting down the world's economy, whole country practically under house arrest, uh, the state paying 10 million people's wages and massive biblical money printing to try and pay for it all. And yeah. uh, I, I just wonder whether, uh, you know, are we going to look back on 2020 as some kind of inflection point where, where politics just changed forever? Is this the start of a, of, of a, you know, this dreaded new normal we keep hearing? About? Yeah, I think we will look back on 2020 as an inflection point. You know, for as long as anyone's been willing to listen to me speak, I've been making the case that this is a the, the financial crisis of 2008 and onwards is a crisis of big government. And I suppose for people like me, Austrian school followers, we've been waiting for some pin to come along and burst the bubble of all this debt. Well, that pin turns out to be coronavirus. But I've, I've always argued this is an epochal crisis. This, the, the global financial crisis and onwards is an epoch defining crisis. Because again, if you look at the data, prior to the First World War, state spending was down at, at less than 20% of GDP, more like sort of 10 to 15% of GDP, depending how you measure it. You then get two enormous spikes. And the world wars were a a crisis of political economy and dramatically transform the way that people perceive the role of the state because after the second world war state spending bounces along at a new level around 40 percent of gdp even with margaret thatcher it didn't dramatically go back to the pre-war levels and what i think we're in is a major crisis of social democracy and big government and the answer to it is first to select the right ideas for how we go forwards and those are the ideas of the philosophy of freedom and um, secondly not to be too radical because 
we have ended up with millions of people dependent on the state for their living and livelihood whether it's in particular pensioners you know we've got just got to look after people the state's made a lot of pledges great great many pledges worth trillions in the end that it's somehow got to fulfill so in the midst of that tangle we've got to give people hope because actually the 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 long march of human civilization has been ever upwards. So yeah, at the moment we face grave threats to our prosperity. The public finances are in a terrible mess. Just looking at the OBR's latest analysis, spending up in the first two months of this uh, uh, crisis year on year by 48%, but tax receipts are down 43%. Well, you know, I can screen share with you if you like some of the some of the data. Very happy to. But the the, the fiscal position is 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 dreadful. So we do face enormous challenges, both in the short run and as a result of 100 years of big government. But equally, at the same time, I, I really want people to believe that the long march of human history is upwards. And if we seize in this epochal moment the ideas of liberty, then we will continue our upward journey. But if the state continues to roll forwards and people turn to an even bigger government than we have now, well, then the destination is uh, ruin and despair. I, I couldn't put it better myself, but one, one of the kind of cornerstones of your own values is this principle of sound money. Now, that's a term not everyone's familiar with. Could, could you just explain what, what's meant by sound money? Yeah, it means money that holds its value so that if you hold on to it, use it as a, a store of value, a unit of account. It's actually reliable. So you know, I'll come down really to brass tacks. I've always believed that a free people would choose money, uh, gold as their money. I actually said money as money. Because gold is money. I don't know what madness it is that's overtaken us for 40 years that we have had this fiat money non-system. And um, if you look at inflation back to 1750, the, the Office for National Statistics did a project with the House of Commons Library. And you get basically a flat line, a little bit of inflation first half of the 20th century. And then from 1971, the value of money collapses. And it, it's there for reasons, the, the figures are like that, for reasons which Alan Greenspan gave in a, an essay called Golden Economic Freedom. The welfare state in the end is ultimately funded by expanding the money supply. Now, normally it's done through the issuance of new debt, through credit expansion. But most recently, it's been done through £745 billion, if people can believe it of QE. So I, I think we're in an insane non-system in the monetary environment. We believe we have a free market, but actually the monetary system is planned by central banks. The biggest name in central banking theory in history was Walter Badger. If people actually read his book, he believed when he wrote the book Lombard Street that there should be no central banks. So you know that that but that all those ideas are the outworking of a set of values so i believe in the equality of all people morally legally politically uh, the equality of opportunity that freedom is from both practical and a philosophical point of view the best way to enable human flourishing and that what this life is about is who we become do we do we become more virtuous a difficult thing for a politician to talk about but do we become more virtuous and better able to participate constructively in the lives of others? Or are we going to head in a direction where we're more de dependent on extracting rents from other people by force through the state? Well, I think put in those terms, it's obvious where I want to go. I, wa I want us to be more virtuous, more free, more able to voluntarily take care of one another. So I think this is a time for choosing in the midst of all this. And we're going to need in the next couple of years some really fantastic leadership from some some great world leaders and I'm, I'm really looking forward to Boris Johnson in particular rising to the challenge. Indeed yes and yeah I suppose if we go back to I think it was August 1971 when Richard Nixon interrupted an episode of Bonanza to tell the American people he was temporarily taking the dollar off the gold standard and, and kind of ushered in the era of funny money and now you know that's kind of gone on the continuum through the, the I guess the 2008 crisis up to this year now what I, I find incredible is what the Federal Reserve is now doing, where they, they, call, they call it going direct. So they're giving hundreds of billions to their chums in BlackRock to go and buy, not no longer just government bonds, but they're buying corporate bonds from some of the biggest companies in the world. They're even BlackRock are buying their own exchange-traded funds 
uh, with funny money from the taxpayer. Now, if you or I did that, we'd go to jail for insider trading, yet this is the way the financial markets are running in America today. How do we defend free market capitalism in the face of this kind of manipulation? Well, the first thing we have to say is that these sorts of uh, episodes are not free market episodes. And that was always my big problem with the 2008 financial crisis. The idea of socializing the downside and privatizing the upside that is not moral it is not free market liberalism and it's wrong now one of the problems we've got is we've got to make all these arguments look attractive and hopeful and that is a tricky thing to do because we can't always be angry and despairing and critical but we do have to i think always in our conversations explain to people that we don't we don't stand for these things which are going on we don't stand for an environment where uh, 745 billion pounds is created and injected into the financial system in order to keep going high levels of government spending well beyond the limits of taxation precisely because it creates creates injustices so th this is this is at the heart of the thing the, the, the conversation if you listen to the left they're always looking for equal outcomes and there's a big philosophical uh, conversation there about where justice lies so I think we, we as free marketers must have regard to outcomes. We don't want to leave anyone in, in a state of misery and despair. We want to be lifting people up. The question is how. But for a very long time, people in the classical liberal tradition have believed that justice is in the process of life. How we interact with one another day by day, our experience as individuals under the law is where the justice lies. And the left, after rules, came to believe that justice was in the outcome. And that's a fundamental departure. Now, if, if, we are in, if we are decent and moral people in pursuit of justice, then it really matters then how the economy works. And if the economy works by exchanging value for value, in other words, I produce software because that's what I was good at, and you produce, um, suppose, say you're running a supermarket chain, where you produce food, I produce software, there's the old coincidence of wants problem of a barter economy, so you have to have money for indirect exchange. These sorts of basics people know. But we know then why, in, a, in, a, in an economy characterized by indirect exchange, we need money. But then we should be asking ourselves, well, what is, what is the right set of characteristics of a good money? Because if you've got a money which I have to earn by producing software, and you have to earn by selling food in a supermarket chain, and yet somewhere else in the system, somebody's earning money because it's being created with this great fountain of new money gushing into the economy. And they're skimming some of it off as they buy bonds from the debt management office and sell them to the Bank of England. And that's how they make their money, stand by standing next to this great fountain gushing money into the economy. Well, you have to ask big questions about whether that's just and moral, because but the point for me is I think we're living in a, a time of profound injustice in the way the economy works because of this monetary environment. The trick is, though, explaining it in a way that's simple and accessible. And I'll be quite honest, I don't think those of us on the free market side of the argument are quite there yet. No, absolutely. I, I, you know, what, one of my concerns is that, that, the, the, you know, that we have this broadening gap. I believe the stats I've seen suggest that the gap between rich and poor is as bad as it now was in the 1920s. Um, and, and probably all this extra money going into you know, financial assets will exacerbate that. And, and a lot of people, I suspect, are blaming capitalism for this and seeing the answer as socialism um, and, and this could, for example, we've got the election coming up in America later this year. Uh, so, you know, we could actually end up lurching even further in that direction because of a fundamental misunderstanding. And who's, who's actually arguing the case for real capitalism instead of crony capitalism? So, Graham, I brought up the analysis of income inequality from the ONS. And uh, it, the figures that are immediately available go back to 1977. And, yeah, the, the figures have come up. But I think I have to say, as a conservative... Um, since 2010, on this measure on the ONS site, in income inequality is marginally down. Um, it's fluctuating around, fluctuating around on original uh, income inequality. It's fluctuating, it fluctuating around what they, the Gini coefficient of about 50%, but it is slight, marginally down. But in terms of your long term, the point you make about the long term, yes, since 1977, income inequality has, has distinctly risen.
Um, but th th one of the things we keep looking in the wrong place, like Nelson, we cover our blind, uh, uh, cover our good eye and say, I see no ships. So we need to look at asset prices. I remember in 2010 when I was elected, the government was committed to looking at uh, uh, the cost of housing because people understood that that was a contributor to the financial crisis. We Institutions hadn't been looking at the cost of housing. So I thought, great, because obviously we'll need to look at asset prices, but no, the CPI H measure, bracket H for housing measure, looks at rents and mortgage interest costs, not the purchase price of the asset. So once more, like Nelson, we see no ships because the institutions are, are looking at measure, particularly if you look at mortgage interest payments, that that's fundamentally dependent on bank rate. So at, at a time when central banks are maintaining what Mark Carney called extraordinary, if not emergency, monetary policy, we're looking, still covering up our, our good eye and, uh, and seeing those ships. So um, I'm, very, I'm very worried that institutions are looking at the wrong data, that we should be looking at asset prices. We should be asking ourselves why stock markets have been coming back up at a time when the economy is still very clearly out there in a state of considerable shutdown. Yeah, and I think the answer is huge liquidity from the Fed that's artificially maintaining those prices. And of course, you know, the small number of people that own those assets already benefit from that and the rest don't, which further exacerbates the gap. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, I, th I think the, you know, the, the question really becomes, you know, what, what can we actually do about that and how do we uh, get the right message out to people? And, but also, I think it also does mean some change in the system. So, uh, yeah. you know, what, what, what sort of measures can you see us practically taking in, in the UK to yeah. try and turn around this situation? So, uh, so if I may, I'll, I'll divide it down in a sense uh, three ways. So the first thing I'd say, talking to investors, we all s face the same problem. We did a search for, for yield. In a sense, um, it's a game of musical chairs. All the time the music is playing, everyone's got to play the game. And that means we're all trying to make money on a rising stock market and, and so on. So clearly investors will have to take the decisions they, they need to take to try and make money in this environment. But they, they should always, I think, have an eye to the possibility that this is musical chairs uh, stoked up by central bank policy, which cannot go on forever. Then you get into a set of questions for policymakers and politicians. So within the current intellectual consensus, consensus which supports central banks and uh, QE and so on, then you're where Rishi Sunak is. And I have to say, I think the chancellor in the UK has play, is playing a hand that's as bad as it could be, absolutely as well as he could. But he stood in, in answer to a question from me at the dispatch box and explained that in the medium term, we will have to return to normal principles of fiscal soundness. Well, that therefore means we need to get to a point where we've restarted the economy and we've announced a range of measures to encourage people to get back to restaurants and pubs and so on. We need to restart the economy, try and get that V-shaped recovery and then see where we are, try and balance the books try and control the debt and try and get to a position where monetary policy can return to something like normal. From my point of view, the biggest question in political economy, though, the, the third aspect is, will it work? Will, 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 will any of this work? I'd love to be wrong. I, I, I actually don't think it, it, that overall this idea of using easy money to prop up the economy overall will work. I think what it will do is create an environment whereby the employment that it, it produces depends fundamentally, as Hayek explained in his Nobel lecture, fundamentally on increasing the supply of new money. And that at some point will go wrong and it's likely to go wrong through inflation coming in. And then the government facing a very difficult choice. Do you let the independent MPC stop QE and start raising interest rates with all that that means for the public finances and cut spending? Or do you change the way that the bank works? And I think I'm afraid that they'll change the way the bank works. I think they'll probably go for nominal GDP targeting. And I think during a recession, increasing the money supply to try and drive up GDP feels to me, and I need to get some academic research done on this, but it feels to me like that is going to be inflationary, that that would enable the bank to keep doing more QE to pursue GDP, uh, thereby keeping the show on the road with government finances. Um, but yeah, if, if, um, if it does all go wrong, I think the right answer is uh, the denationalization of, of money. 
to let people use gold as money, to let people use cryptocurrencies as money. And yes, those things would have to be taxed. And I think also to reform the way central banks work. So it might be that we had a period where people had um, debit cards with direct access to accounts with, backed by central bank reserves instead of bank credit. Those sorts of things could happen. But they're all, they're all major. It, all of them would represent a major crisis in the monetary system. But I have to say it's a crisis I would prefer to avoid for the sake of the 100,000 or so people who live in my constituency who I represent. No, indeed. But I think, I think one of the challenges I have with this, and, and I, I'm certainly with you on the kind of principles of sound money, is, is just kind of where it all leads and where it ends. Because already, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing so much of this I call it the magic money tree or modern monetary theory. There's, there's this feeling developing that there is no limit to the extent to which we can do this and we can answer everything. And to be fair, you'd have to say in both Britain and America now, you'd struggle to say that there's a major political party that is what you could call fiscally conservative, that they're all jumping in in the same way. Um, so, so I just wonder how we, having, having let this genie out the bottle, is there really any way we put it back in? Um, and and where, do you, where do you actually see it ending, assuming there is no major change? Is it, is it in hyperinflation? Well, that might well be the case. Um, I hope not. I really, really hope not. I endorsed a book, though, called Paper Money Collapse by a guy called Detlev Schlichter, who's very, very good a German economist. Um, and his point is that because we keep responding to all these crises by easing the, mon easing the monetary environment, that continually sows distortions in the economy and how it works. And they're, they're difficult distortions to, ca to characterize and explain and Hayek wrote a book called The Pew Theory of Capital and, and it's a very thick book and it really it fails in its task of cata cataloging these distortions but in the end it, 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 he concludes with something of a rant against mainstream economists who completely neglect, neglect these phenomena so the way it could work is you, you sow all these distortions you end up with an economy and prices so far removed from the actual preferences of the great bulk of people that eventually something goes wrong and, and, and the normal market process isn't working the way it should. And, and that the main phenomenon at the heart of that would be that the economy is too oriented towards the, the increasing supply of, of new money. So somewhere in there, inflation will start coming in. Then the big question is, what do the authorities do if inflation starts building up through 4%? So the 2% plus the, the window. And if, if what they do is change the monetary institutions that we have in order to keep the, the flow of new money going to prop up the state, then I think we are into uh, an environment which could produce hyperinflation. So we've already had members of the MPC, uh, so uh, Dr. Vega in particular, uh, explaining that when you look at what the transactional if, if you look at the transactions that the bank is engaging in, he, he characterized it as like the Weimar Republic or Zimbabwe. But the point that he was making that the bank governor would want me to emphasize is that the difference is that the, 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 ba the bank's monetary policy committee is independent. In other words, they are legally bound not to um, allow inflation to go above target. So they would pull the plug on the government's finances before they allowed inflation to soar. And that's why they're able to conduct monetary interventions of this scale. And they've told us that at the Treasury Committee. It is because of the independence of the MPC that they can intervene in the monetary system on this scale. But this then raises this profound question, what happens if inflation's coming in and the government still needs to borrow enormous sums of money? And that's the moment of decision. And I think if that, in that moment of decision, the wrong choice is made, then we could have a hyperinflationary collapse of the currency. Now, from an Austrian school point of view, um, you know, you all, it always ends like this. If you prop an economy up with monetary expansion, it, it ends one of two ways. Either you end the monetary expansion and the uh, ruin that has been sown becomes revealed and you have a correction, or you get an inflation. And if that inflation is allowed to accelerate, then it destroys the currency. But the big problem people like me have got with this argument is people will turn to me and say, Steve, where's the inflation? Mm. And my answer is, well, it's in asset prices and we're not looking at it. 
but we, 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 we all of us have to ask ourselves, what are the deflationary forces at work? What are the countermanding inflationary forces from the bank? Well, we think we know what those are. And what will this mean in a moment of crisis? So what, what a job that needs doing, which I yet, have yet to do, is to boil this all down into things which are easy to understand slogans backed up by relatively short papers and videos and social media which can say to the public these are this is the choice you face it's an old choice either more government more coercion more false promises that can't be honestly kept or to live in a system of honest money honest taxation honest government that lives within its means and that i'm afraid does mean that there's a cap on the size of the state that we can run and that's about 35 percent of gdp and now let's live honestly within our means. Well, I think, I think as soon as we finish this interview, you better get started on that work because it's getting quite urgent. So uh, yeah. let's talk about the other thing that I know is close to your heart, although it's been kind of forced off the agenda recently, and that, and that is Brexit. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, we, we had the slightly surprising, perhaps, referendum result. And at a time when you could argue we needed Henry Kissinger, we kind of got Theresa May. And uh, you know, as you look back, what, what do you think were the kind of errors in our strategy for negotiating that, that led us to where we are today? Well, that's another huge question, Graham. Um, the single biggest problem has been that the governing uh, class, for want of a better term, has fundamentally not accepted the result. It doesn't like the result. The result is a repudiation of what they stand for. And of course, what they stand for is them having power over other people's lives in the end. Uh, most people involved in politics and government want power for themselves. I'm possibly an exception because I'm a classical liberal. I want to give power away. Uh, most conservatives, all conservatives perhaps, ought, ought to want to do that. So the fundamental problem was a thoroughgoing rejection of the result. But I think see Brexit as being of a piece with all the other issues that I've been talking about. So the peace scheme that is the European Union, and it, it is a peace scheme, it comes out of the horror of the Second World War, and we shouldn't deny that. But what it does is it uses political integration in a sense to deliver free trade as a side effect. But the problem with that political integration is it escapes democratic control. And you saw that with the Constitution for Europe being rammed through as the Lisbon Treaty precisely to avoid referendums. And that's what got me into politics, this feeling that wow, wow, what is happening that politicians are willing to establish political uh, institutions of such scope positively against the wishes of the public, and I am not having that. So this issue of money and how the state works and the structure of the EU and power and free trade, they're all of a piece. It's about, to me, a, a really major global crisis moving from the social democratic way of doing things, top-down, hierarchical, driven by power, driven by the opinions of philosopher kings in authority, moving from all of that to a much more bottom-up system, much more classically liberal, much more free, within the rule of law, but much more horizontally organised, much flatter. So as we leave the European Union, we've rejected the emergent, vertically organised international system that the EU was the most advanced, I would say, uh, aspect of. And instead, by the UK going for a normal free, to tr free trade agreement with the EU, plus bilaterals with Japan, the United States of America, Australia, New Zealand, and acceding to the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, wow, this is absolutely game-changing for the world. Because this means the UK, as a major economic player, is now catalyzing, delivering free trade through a much more horizontal and multilateral system. They call it sometimes plurilateral. But the point is to deliver free trade without vertical political integration. And I don't think people have quite yet realised that this, if it succeeds, and I believe it must, will set the pattern for power in the world for a, a, another hundred years, just as in the last hundred years, we've progressively gone to uh, a, a, a more vertical system. So. That's really to try and step back and say, well, what's going on in the world? The structure of power is changing. And I think if you look further afield, look at Russia and China versus the USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, UK, Pacific Rim, South America. We're moving to Eurasian autocracies versus uh, maritime, demo maritime democracies, market-led maritime democracies. 
So China and, and Russia, Iran are the countries where they most obviously are authoritarian, not much interested in how people vote, hugely intervene in their economies, big state-backed enterprises. Whereas however falteringly, and for all our flaws, in the UK and the other maritime market-led democracies, we do still believe in free market capitalism, free of distortions. We make some terrible mistakes, in particular in relation to the monetary system, but we do still basically believe in a market economy. So I, I think those are the factors which are at, uh, at work and that Brexit is just one component of a major shift in the way that power is structured and that that shift is very necessary to solving all the problems which have been the subject of our conversation. Interesting. That's, that's a very inter interesting analysis. That, I mean, for, for my own sake, I suppose, I, I don't see that much difference between Donald Trump's America and the People's Republic of China. They've both got elements of capitalism plus massive state intervention. Um, but, and, and it could even get worse if, if, if perhaps the, the election result goes the way it might. But we've got, I, I think to me, what, again, a message I'm not hearing all that loudly, to be frank, coming out of Westminster is that Brexit is actually a once in a lifetime opportunity to, to shape a, a whole new Britain. Um, uh, one, one analogy I've heard is like the Singapore of Europe, maybe we can bring in 3 million people from Hong Kong escaping China's new security laws and they can help us to build that kind of society. So, you know, what, what, what do you see as your kind of dream vision of Brexit Britain and, and, and you know, how, how are we gonna get there? Well, my dream vision would be one that recaptures the great spirit of liberalism, which made this country as, the fantastic world leader uh, that it was. I mean, we are still today a great country in the world and friends like the Australians can't believe the spirit of deprecation that we pour upon ourselves. You know, when I talk with them, they say, you know, why have you talked about yourselves in such downbeat terms? You're the UK. And then they'll, they'll trot out all our positive features. So my, my dream would be that we become comfortable with who we are, and who we are as a free people who believe in one another, believe in our moral, legal, political equality, and believe that we best serve one another when we're free. And then set about demonstrating to the world that we can establish institutions which have a bit of integrity about them and which live out those principles. So there are plenty of people frightened right now, and I have to be very careful to make sure that I'm not misunderstood. I'm not suggesting a sweeping away of our institutions, I'm suggesting that all of our institutions become much more honest about what they can achieve, much more humble about the purposes of power. So of course we'll keep the NHS. Of course with the NHS will be free at the point of use. It's what the public want. But will we, end, will we be able forever to uh, run big governments fundamentally financed by the Bank of England's money printing? No. Will we need to rediscover this idea that even the most selfish are forced to serve others in a market economy? Yeah. Do we need to ruthlessly go through our regulatory system to ensure that everything we do is pro-competitive, that all of our sectors of our economy are contestable, that we don't distort our economy? And, it, and crucially, I think this is where your China versus USA uh, analogy is, I think, deserves a lot of thought. Is when you look at what Trump is saying, and Lighthizer, their uh, special trade representative, has just written in Foreign Affairs magazine. In a sense, what they're trying to do is to get free trade without importing distortions. So the obvious example is China produces more steel every year now than the UK has ever produced, but it does it with massive state subsidies in land and energy. Well, we can't, as the Western world, afford to be naive in running a free market steel industry and then importing the distortions from China. And I think, in a sense, that's what Trump is dealing with. He doesn't articulate it very well, but I think that's where we need to go. Not protectionism, but in a sense, defending against other people's market distortions. And I think that's legitimate. If someone else is distorting their market, by aggressively subsidizing an industry which will then take out our free market institutions and competitive environment, it is reasonable to defend against that distorted regime. Because we can't afford to be naive about what China and Russia and others will do. Uh, so so that, that's where I want us to be, a nation that believes in free trade but not naively. And that's why I think things like CPTPP are very important because they're leading the area of the world where most growth is gonna come from 
in a direction of free trade with rules, more horizontally organized and with the UK as a crucial player. So that, okay. my, that's my vision, free trade, but fair trade. Uh, and and, and as, as we come to the end of our, our time together, Steve, I think uh, it, lo it looks increasingly likely that we're going to come out of this with a kind of a no deal exit. Um, now, I remember the, the build up to the, the new millennium. I was working in IT at the time. And we all thought the banking systems would collapse, airplanes would fall out the sky. We actually got to the, 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 the new millennium and, and nothing happened. It was a complete non-event. Uh, do you think Brexit actually might end up being a non-event or do you think there's actually a lot of pain lined up for us next January? Well, if everybody carries out their contingency plans and as they did last time we faced the possibility of a no-deal Brexit, we should find that there is considerable smoothing. So, I, but I, I, would be, I would be irresponsible if I pretended there would be no disruptions. If we leave the European Union without a security agreement in place, without a free trade agreement in place, if we need to introduce tariffs on goods coming in from the EU, then there will be some disruption. But I'm afraid the UK has taken a major decision to change the structure of power in the world and in Europe, and we now must see it through. I was the minister responsible for no deal preparation. And, you know, I'm therefore, I at least was, very across all of the details as they stood. And one of the frustrations I had at the time was that the May administration wouldn't engage externally to prepare at the pace that was necessary. But that changed. When Boris came to power, Michael Gove was specifically given the task of getting us ready. So we've had some extra time. There's no excuse now for not being ready to leave with no uh, future agreement. Now, that said... I think there would be some disruption if we leave without, for example, uh, security cooperation and a free trade agreement in place. And I can't pretend otherwise. But what I think will actually happen this, this time, as last time when we approached no deal, is that people will put in place contingencies to make sure there's continuity. And in particular, I cannot see the European Council blindly trudging forwards towards exit with no free trade agreement. They will, I think, do what is in all of their people's interests and move off a quite unreasonable territory of insisting we stay within the jurisdiction of their Supreme Court. And instead, we will become a free country. But it, the only way it's going to happen is if we find the courage to stand firm and say, we will leave with no agreements in place if you insist on keeping us within your political and legal sphere. That is what we chose to reject. So I am optimistic we'll get a, get a deal, but I'm afraid it will be something of a roller coaster between here and Christmas. OK, well, there's been some great insights there. And thanks very much for sharing, sharing them with us today. Steve Baker, thanks for joining me. You're most welcome.